when you're making something easier and making a difference, what does that look like? What does it feel like? Like what, what is the emotion that you're going to go through? Maybe you're thinking about being in a certain place. Great. What, what's the furniture in that place? What are the smells in that place? If it's a restaurant, what's your favorite meal that you're going to eat when you're having this conversation and making things easier? Welcome to Gratitude Geek. I'm Candace Rodardi. Today, I'm joined by the motivational firewood guy, Steve Gamlin. Welcome. Hey there, Candace. Thank you so much. Looking forward to our conversation. I can't wait to hear this story. How did you become the motivational firewood guy? Well, it all started when I was 11 years old. I wanted to be a radio DJ, like my hero, Dr. Johnny Fever on WKRP in Cincinnati. I a did stand-up comedian, because Steve Martin was huge at the time. I wanted to write my own books because my mom instilled a love of reading and writing and my sister and I, and I wanted to be a teacher of people, but not in the classroom because I had this amazing fifth grade teacher named Mrs. Farron, who, whenever I finished my work early, she encouraged me to just kind of help out or work with some of the other students who maybe were struggling a little bit with the lesson. So she had me actually coaching people when I was 11 years old, long before I knew what visualization was and goals were. I was taking these little steps to make all of these things happen. And about 20 years ago, I became a speaker. And that's where the motivational firewood part came from. I went to a National Speakers of New England meeting. First timer. Everybody else has these gorgeous lanyards and they're all in suits and I'm in jeans and a button down shirt with a, hi, my name is Steve. And a guy says, hey, Steve, you know, glad to have you here. What do you do? I said, I want to be a motivational speaker. He said, all right, great. What makes you different? I said, I want to help people. I said, Steve, we all want to help people. He said, what makes you different? And God love him, patience of a saint. About three to five minutes later, I finally just, out of ideas, I said, look, Don, if somebody's coming to hear me speak, it means they've got some frustration in their life. They might have a spark of something pretty amazing, but they don't know what to do with it. And if I share a story or a tip or a tactic or an example or something, and the next day they wake up and take that, do something with it. It's like I gave him a piece of motivational firewood and he snapped his fingers and he goes, that is different, unique, and cool. He said, you know, the best part, the way your face just lit up when you said that, he said, young man, go trademark that phrase. He goes, I think you'll do well when this summer is 20 years. I hope you've told him. Thank you. I have many times <laughs> over the years and every couple of years when I have to renew the trademark, I send him a message and I say, Another thousand bucks. Still the motivational firewood guy. So you've had a lot of mentors in your life. Many. What is something that all those mentors had in common? I can tell you what three of them had in common was the first name, Dan. Ah. And when I told that recently on a podcast, one was my friend, Danny, one of my best friends. When I was 24, he was 23. Super low point in my life. That's when most of them come around is when I'm in the ashes again. And he asked why I never followed my dream of being on the radio. So I did. And I got my first radio job in September of 1992. Oh, groovy. And, and he passed away three weeks later. Oh. And I did 10 years on the radio, worked DJing weddings almost every weekend that whole time, burnt myself into the ground, bailed on radio. My first marriage fell apart and I was tens of thousands of dollars in debt. And then the next man, the next little guardian angel came along. And after a particular day hitting golf balls in a thunderstorm, daring the lightning to hit me, he asked, how was your week? And I said, well, here's what happened yesterday. And when he stopped laughing, he asked, have you ever thought of being a motivational speaker or a stand-up comedian? I think you'd be great at both. He didn't know those were goals of mine. Two weeks later, my first comedy class. A week after that, my first Toastmasters meeting. Awesome. Here we are. So I did Toastmasters for seven years. I went through the whole program. Did you do the whole program? I just did the first, the basic one in the humorously speaking and a couple of the creative uh, speeches thing. I never wanted to be anything part of leadership or running a competition. All I wanted to do was speak and compete. And I had a blast doing that. Eight years. I had more fun running the contests than participating in them. I think that Toastmasters, for, for those of you listening who don't know what Toastmasters is, it is a public speaking club and it's really inexpensive i don't know if it's still less than a hundred dollars a year but it's super super inexpensive and you learn how to do two things be a speaker and be a leader mm -hmm. some people just do the, the speaker track and some people do the leadership track i i decided to do both because i wanted that title i wanted that distinguished toastmaster title and when you do both tracks you get that fancy little title on your name badge um but i learned that i could do 
amazing things because I had to because of Toastmasters. As a district leader, I had to put on a contest. I actually had to put on six contests, but it, within a year's time, I put on six speaking contests and they were awesome, right? And and I could find the caterer and I could find the venue, but here's the most important thing. To this day, and it's been eight or eight years, no, it's been more than 10 years since I've been in a Toastmasters club. To this day, some of my closest friends I met through Toastmasters. It's good, just good people. Very good people. And, you know, I told them all day one, well, the first day, I should say, when they asked me to be in charge of something, I just looked at them and said, I am not the guy you want to put in charge of anything. I will compete anytime, anywhere. Even one time, there weren't enough contestants for a contest. So me and another gentleman looked at each other and said, raised our hands, said, we're in. No preparation because I just, I loved the challenge mm -hmm. of just being impromptu. Whether or not it was a table topics, impromptu competition. I just, I love speaking and something always comes out of it something really good that i'm grateful for every single time that may not have happened in my brain otherwise i was disqualified from competing in a contest once because of i don't there was it was something i won the contest but i was disqualified because paperwork or something i don't i don't even remember but i went and i supported the the next level of the contest so you know maybe area to district or whatever or division and so i went in support for the person who actually took the, my place as winner to compete. And the question that they asked in Table Topics, Table Topics is a two minute or two to three minute speech about a, a topic you have no idea what it is. It was actually, it was actually a question that I had a five to seven minute speech on. <laughs> and I was oh. like, I could have taken this all the way. <laughs> I could have taken this all the way if the paperwork hadn't have been wrong. <laughs> yep. I once got DQ'd because both timers who were first timers at this position at a, a contest failed to keep the time. Neither of them ever hit any of the lights nor held up any of the cards, which is the backup system. And I was you delivering were too, a brand new speech. They were too engaged in your conversation. In your That's speech. what the area governor said during my meltdown in the hallway because <laughs> I was not happy. It was a speech that I could have taken very far. And it was, I was brand new at it. So I depended on that timer to know when to shift into my closing. Yeah. And I, I got near the end and I looked over and I go, I haven't seen a light yet. Oh my gosh. Did I get through that very quickly? Let me do another 30 seconds just to make sure 30 seconds later, still no light, still no card. So I ended it and I got DQ'd and the person who actually wound up winning ran to the governor, the, the person in charge of the contest and said, that's not fair. Steve actually won because nobody timed him mm -hmm. but i got dq'd by the rules and yeah. i apologized to the area governor the next day but yeah. i was not happy in that moment <laughs> yeah well when you're dealing with humans you get human error yeah yeah so let's shift shift gears to gratitude so you have a very unique way of practicing gratitude i would love to hear about it yeah for about the last 13 years and this is something i heard a tip and a tactic from a speaker friend of mine who said, yeah, I get up every day and I write down something I'm grateful for. And he said, but I don't do just the generic thing. Like I'm thankful for my health, my home and my partner. And he said, I try to get specific. So for about 13 years, I've written down on 90 plus percent of the mornings, my three favorite moments from the previous day as emotionally connected and descriptive as possible, but in less than a line each for all those people who say, I don't have time for that. I'll write the date, the words great stuff. And then I write one, two, three, and in less than a line each, I'll describe those things in as vivid detail as possible. So that even years later, I can probably tap back into the emotion. That has been the greatest gift I've given to myself over the past 13 years. And some people say, oh yeah, I'm thankful for you know my health, my wealth, my, my, my house, my partner. I'll see them a few weeks later. I'll go, Hey, what are you grateful for today? And they go, my health, my house, my partner. I'm like, dude, why don't you just get a potato and carve that into it and get a little stamp <laughs> because you're losing the impact of it. The more times you just repetitively say the same thing becomes disingenuous. If you repeat the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Loses its, its oomph, its flavor, its zest, its, its charge yeah. over time. I believe. I like the way that you are very specific. And I also like that you put a date on it because opening up that journal, I'm not a journaler. I'm, I'm very embarrassed to say, but open, but opening up that journal, seeing the date and then seeing that thing that you're grateful for. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. I was on a podcast one time and the host said, 
what's the connection for that? Like, how does that impact your life? And I just happened to have one in the studio here because I was doing something for a podcast and I opened it up and I started laughing. It was an entry from at that point, seven or eight years prior when my dad and I had rescued his plow truck from the local mechanic and got it home without getting pulled over by the cops because it was unregistered, uninspected, barely roadworthy. And on the way home, of course, I get to the first rotary. Who's there? A cop merging in. So I said, go ahead, sir. And he goes, hey, thanks, buddy. I'm like, you bet. So the next morning I wrote down, got Nellie home. Nellie was the name of the plow truck, avoided the cop. And seven years later, I told that story. He goes, all that from one line? I said, it's the way I wrote it. It's, yeah, you, you were prompted for to remember the memory. And, you know, that's a really, if you have, oh my gosh, if you have somebody who has a family history of dementia or Alzheimer's, knowing that and then keeping that really simple three-line journal might help the person that has Alzheimer's or dementia hang on to some memories for a little bit longer. Maybe. What a great my, idea. My dad had Parkinson's and he had some cognitive issues in the last couple of years of his life, but he always remembered that one. And yeah. uh, we, we had a joke between us. If, if Nelly, the plow truck was a stripper, her name would have been rusty glitter. <laughs> <laughs> he always remembered that one. And I, Cause I told him that one day, he said, I moved Nelly today. I go, I can tell there was a rust trail halfway across the driveway and a big pile. I go, let me guess. That's where you slam the door. He goes, yep. <laughs> so Rusty Glitter's job was to pull the plow? Was uh, just to plow his driveway during the winter. Oh, it, snow plow. It never left the yard otherwise. Okay. But we had to bring it to the mechanic that time, and we snuck it down in the dark of night and, and back. <laughs> there is, I live in Michigan, and we have a gentleman that lives on the end of our alley. Oh, living in an old house with an alley is, I just, I don't understand why... Houses aren't built this way anymore because having an alley is so glorious. I love, yeah. I love it. I don't have a driveway in the front of my house. I have an alley, you know. Nice. But anyway, the guy who lives on the very end of the alley, he's probably in his seventies, possibly even eighty, and he has a glitter, uh, a Nelly glitter, what, what, what yeah. <laughs> glitter rusty sparkle, glitter. rusty glitter. He has a rusty glitter truck, um, and every winter. He puts that plow down and he runs it through our alley and we are so grateful for him. And that's the only time I ever see him drive that truck. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Stuff like that is so cool. I mean, look at, look at the reaction we're both having right now, just talking about this and oh, the yeah. emotions it brings. This stuff's magic. And most people, they, they just say, well, I'm, I'm too busy to worry about that. I mean, I, I recorded my process one day with my journal, 38 seconds to write down the date, great oh, stuff wow. and all three. That's how long it took. <sighs> Oh, okay. I have enough time to journal. I don't, I don't know why I don't do it. I did it when I was younger. I don't know why I don't do it now. I love it. Yeah. I don't know why. So I, I have a gratitude practice that I need to re re-engage because it's one that's more in line with what I can actually, this is self-talk. We can talk about self-talk here in a minute. I don't know why I don't have it set on my phone right now. I have a new phone. It might be that, but um, my, the alarm goes off on my phone. And when it does, I say five things for which I'm grateful. It was at 12.34 every day, but it, 12.34 is in the middle of the day, and I was inevitably in a Zoom meeting when it went off. <laughs> so I changed it to after work. But yeah. I think I did it at 9.10, because at 9.10, there was, I wasn't talking to anybody. When you have a practice that you just do every day, and yeah, some days it's, a, oh, you had a great dinner. I, I got to talk to my friend or, you know, it, 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 whatever it is that you say out loud that you're grateful for it just you know oh today was a great day yeah you know yeah. and there's a lot going on in the world right now it's been the world has been in upheaval this is the middle of july 2024 the world is in chaos right now yeah. but if you are grateful for what you have and yeah. your neighbor is grateful for what they have the chaos isn't going to matter yeah yeah 100 percent. because you know what at at any given time my whole world is this house and it's me and my wife, Tina, and it's our little existence on this dead end street off another dead end street in a little town in the woods in New Hampshire, a, such a small town. We don't have street lights, sidewalks. They won't even pay for yellow paint to put a stripe down in the middle of the road. It's an honor system. And we are absolutely grateful for this every single day that we are, we choose to not let all the chaos and the poison of the world crawl into our lives. We're aware of what's going on in the world but we're not getting steamrolled by it every day because we choose to remain grateful for what we have and what we can control. And that's, that's good enough. 
I want to talk about gratitude for not having the line in the middle of the road. We just had our streets repaved. They are the streets are about 150 years old, mm -hmm. and underneath the, the very bottom of the layer, when they tore everything up, was the original cobblestones or the you know the original brick floor or and they tore it all up, uh, and then they put down new new roads and they narrowed the roads so it wasn't as wide. And we were, and then they didn't they you still can only park on one side of the road. Um, but they didn't replace the lines. They didn't replace. No, no, listen, listen. And the roads are narrower. So yeah. really, when you have a car parked and then the and then you're driving, there's really only enough room for one car. Mm -hmm. And that means that people drive slower down this road now. And I am grateful for that. Yep. So I now understand the reasoning behind not putting the line in the middle of the road because the line would have messed up the flow of traffic because now people just wait if there's cars parked on the other side people just wait until the other cars you know they they are courteous to each other rather than trying to squeeze by each other because the wide, road was wide enough and there was a line yeah does that make sense oh 100 percent. and and kudos to you for for seeing that little shining light in it you know my first thought was ooh, a lot of people are going to be getting their side mirrors replaced yeah but it, none of that's happened and before Good. Before there were accidents on that road. There was actually, I had a party once. If you came to that party, you're going to remember this story. I had a party once, and we were inside. It was a Christmas party. We were inside, and we heard this, ur, ur, ur. and um, we looked out the window. And one of the party goers said, "They, that's my car." It was a woman who was 80 years old. I kid you not, she could not see over her steering wheel, wheel, and she hit she oncoming car. Uh, what is that called when they oncoming two cars hit each other oncoming what's that called like, like a head-on collision head-on head-on yeah. and then she backed up the car and ran into another car <laughs> this is a woman who should not have had a driver's license wow <laughs> anyway yeah took out she took out two cars <laughs> overachiever i hope that they took away her driver's license after that. <laughs> hopefully but yeah that hasn't happened since because wow. the the way the road is laid out, there's just no, I mean, there's no line, so you don't think that you're on the right side of the road, right? Yep. You just let the cars go. Yep. Anyway, yeah, that's finding gratitude in something as silly as the road in front of your house. Yeah, you yeah, know, absolutely. You know, and it's so easy and simple to do. And of course, then you get the people who really don't want to do it, so they start making excuses, like Steve. You know, some days there's nothing to be grateful for. I say, that's well, bullshit. Okay, that's your opinion. Yeah, I said, because we lost my dad on October 3rd of 2018. And on October 4th, I wrote down three of the easiest gratitudes I've ever had. Um, dad stayed alive long enough for me to get to the hospice. I was holding his hand when he passed. And we were watching his favorite show. Of course, he was, you know, on another planet at that point with, yeah. with meds and stuff for pain. But we're watching The Price is Right. And my sister and I still to this day have a running joke because my dad's favorite show was Price is Right while he ate lunch. And his favorite part was the showcase showdown at the end. And somebody was going to win a trip to Croatia. And that's right when dad passed. So my sister and I still say, and we'll never know who got to go to Croatia. <laughs> and it makes us think of dad and we laugh, which dad would have loved. He would have thought yeah. that was hysterical. So that was what I wrote the morning after the worst experience in my life of losing my dad. Yeah. I have so many moments of gratitude from when my mom passed away. Yeah. A lot of similar ones. My, my, the most profound memory though, is being in the lead car of the processional and my sister says, turn around. And I turned around and I couldn't, there wasn't, I couldn't see the end of the cars oh, wow. and knowing how many lives my mom had impacted that people who had driven from s different States to be there for that processional. We had a graveside service, so we had no idea how many people were going to be there. I still get a little overclumped and it's been 12, 12 or 14 years, yeah. you know, but just how, knowing how many people, and then to think, can I make that big of an impact in my community? And that's pretty, it's pretty profound. And that gratitude, yeah. you don't, I still feel it. I still yeah. feel it when I think about turning around and seeing all those cars, how grateful I was for the, for the lesson that she had taught me. She taught me how to gather people, right? You and I are having this conversation right now, but this is not the last time you and I are going to talk. Right. Because you are now in my circle. 100%. Yeah. So, and my mom taught me how to do that. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about this vision board behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Fire away. This is my well, lane. You're, you're the vision board, dude. I want to talk. Oh, I want I you to tell me the importance of vision boards. 
vision knowing board that me, I believe you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vision board to me, and when people ask, they say, Oh, Steve, I made a vision board. I go, Great, send me the picture. You know what I see most of the time? Lamborghini, a yacht, a private jet, a mansion, a helicopter, a big honking gold watch, and a bank vault full of gold bars and piles of cash. And the first thing I say to them all is, That's a delightful letter to Santa Claus. The second thing I say is, There's not a single thing wrong with any of those. But to me, a vision board is a well mounted GPS for the rest of and the best of your life. It's not just what you want to get, but who you want to become in the process. Best version of yourself, because material things, you can get them and they can all go away. And what are you left with? So when I create vision boards or work with people or, you know, they invest in my program or hear me speak or hear me on a podcast, there's eight major areas of life the way that I do this. It's a life wheel, pretty standard tool in personal development. But the way I teach it, your physical health, your emotional well-being, your closest relationships, your core values that guide every thought, word, and action, your faith and spirituality that do exactly the same, but the authority comes from a different direction, your connection to the world in real ways, and your work and your money. All of these, minimum one goal per category. And I believe you've got a fully fledged out vision for the best of your life. As long as you do the work to identify what you really want and who you really want to be. That's the way I explain it. It's not an arts and crafts project. And the way I explain it, it's not all woo-woo like I get all the time from people. I said, look, dude, I'm blue collar woo. I'm going to show you the tools. We're going to roll up our sleeves and actually do the work, not just set it and forget it like an old, you know, Saturday morning infomercial with the roast chicken. Set it and forget it. That's not manifesting. Mm -mm. Building your vision and taking action. That's manifesting. Well, taking that, taking action is the most important thing. If you put it on your vision board and then you have an inspiration to do something, but you don't do it, then why did you, why is it on your vision board? Yeah. We, we conducted a survey about five or six years ago, myself and my then digital marketing person. And we asked people, if you made a vision board, but the things didn't happen, you didn't manifest them, you didn't achieve them, receive them, whatever, what do you think was the biggest reason? And we gave them about seven or eight choices. They could choose as many as they wanted. 60% of people said they failed because they never took action on their goals. 47% mm -hmm. of people said they weren't really sure about what they wanted. They didn't get it clear enough. Mm. Duh. If it's yeah. not going to fire you up, you're not going to pursue it with any great deal of dedication. Yeah. Just not. It's like the task that you don't really feel like doing. What happens? You procrastinate on it. You do nothing. You, you, you'd rather do every excuse in the book to not do it than to do it. And what's that going to do for your success and your yeah. confidence? Yeah. So do you want to hear a funny story? <laughs> sure. I love funny stories. My vision board is in the back of my, is is behind me. If, if you're listening to the audio version and not the, the uh, video. So my vision board is behind me and on my vision board is a green bicycle. That green bicycle is now in my garage and it doesn't have tires. <laughs> So did it have tires in the well, picture? Did the universe like screw up the delivery in some way? So, so here is the thing. I have the bicycle. It happened. But I was relying on my husband to replace the tires. The tires are in our house. We have the mm -hmm. tires. They have not been placed on the bicycle. So I could take action and take it to a bike shop and have the tires put on there. And I'm taking responsibility for that right now. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you know, because there some, you go. Because you can't rely on other people to make your dreams come true. Yeah. And I, I love my husband. Please do not take that wrong. <laughs> but the putting disclaimer the, rolling putting, across the screen. Putting, putting the tires on the bicycle is my priority, not his. Yeah. He has other things he's doing, right? Yeah. It's not, you know, it's a to him, it's a nuisance to have that in, in the garage. For yeah. me, I just haven't, I should, I should just take care of it myself. Yeah. And I'm sure it's not that hard to put the tires on the wheels. No, I could probably no. watch a video and figure it out. Yeah. I, I had a, a, a mountain bike that I bought actually maybe 24 years ago uh, during at the tail end of my radio career. And I wanted to just get healthy and do a little riding. And I rode it a few times and it got a flat tire. And then I went through my divorce and all of that. And it wound up hanging in the garage at my dad's for 20 years. Mm. And I took it down recently and realized it needed two tubes. And I kept saying, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. It sat in our garage for a year. And I finally said, why am I going to go out and ride on unsafe roads here in our small town? Because people fly and there's no lines and curbs or anything. Yeah. One of my other goals since my very first vision board around 2005 is kindness. So I went online. I found just two towns away 
a mile from where I grew up is a nonprofit that gives bikes to people who are underprivileged, who may not be able to afford a car, who have to get to work or do that's their mode of transportation. And I reached out to them or I brought it over and they said, well, do you need a receipt? Nope. You're just giving it to us. Yep. The guy goes, it's like brand new. I said, well, yeah, because I haven't ridden it in 20 years. Yeah, I hosed it, it off. It does need tubes. <laughs> but it, yeah, yeah, but what was I going to do with it anyway? We have a Peloton cycle. I ride 3,000 miles a year on that. And this thing hasn't moved in 20 plus years. Yeah. So it just became all of a sudden I had this thing that I could be valuable to really achieve my goal, which is to be kind. Yeah. And, and do acts of kindness. And now some person who couldn't afford a bike now gets to ride this thing because they fix them and then give them to, to folks in need. Yeah. And so what the, what I wanted my bicycle for is I live in a community where I can bicycle anywhere if I wanted to. And I wanted the bicycle so that I could go to the farmer's market on Saturday, get vegetables, bike home instead of getting in the car. But I haven't needed to do that. I haven't needed to use the bicycle because we have two cars right now. You know, I'm not forced to do it. <laughs> I need my daughter to take her and her car and leave <laughs> so that I'm forced <laughs> No, I want my daughter to stay here. My daughter yeah. just finished grad school. She was away. She was in South Dakota for two years. So she was really ready to not be, she wanted to come home. Yeah. <laughs> After being in South Dakota for two years alone, she wanted to come home. And we we're like, yeah. you can come home for as long as you want, honey. Um, yeah. And I want her to be here for as long as she wants. But yeah, nice. but if, if without the second car, I would be forced to get the basket, fix the tires, put the basket on the car, on the bike and you know, go to the yeah. farmer's market because, I, you know, I want my tomatoes. It's summer. Yep. I live in Michigan. I want my corn. Oh my God, corn on the cob in Michigan tastes like but like uh, sugar. It's just the most yeah. amazing thing. And my tomatoes. I want my tomatoes, right? Yep. So anyway, yeah, I just, I don't have, I don't have enough motivation. Yeah. So vision and motivation kind of go together. And knowing your why. Yeah. Like a deeply emotionally connected why to something. Because, and, and somebody said it again to me the other day, your why needs to make you cry. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. that's cute. It rhymes. It doesn't have to be that intense well. that it makes you cry. Unless they're cheers of joy. I mean, that, okay. But it's it's just got to be enough that's going to keep that, the the procrastination and the imposter and all of these other things. It's kind of like the gas in your tank. And it's what keeps a little pebble from becoming a Jersey barrier of an obstacle is if you know your why. You're going to keep going because that's more compelling than all the excuses that could pile up. You know, that little pebble in the right situation inside of a clam can become a pearl. Yeah. So sometimes that little irritation yeah. is all you need. Yep. My the other thing right here is difference. The word above it says easy, easy yeah. difference. I want to make a difference and I want it to be easy. That's really general. You know, that is a really general, broad why. I want to make a difference and I want it to be easy. That's too broad. So talk about narrowing down your vision. Yeah. Being more specific. How, yeah. How would, like, how would, what would that mean? What are the different situations? So that when they happen in your head, it's going to be like, make this easy. If you start <laughs> to think of, of the stories involved, you know, and I, I say to people all the time, look, I've got a story behind every single picture on my vision board of what it means to me. And whenever possible, Add all of your senses to it. That's why I ask people, I go, what do your goals look like? And they start to tell me the obvious. I go, great. What do they sound like? What do they feel like? What do they smell like? What do they taste like? And usually when we get it to taste and smell, they're like, ew. Yeah. <laughs> My goals are supposed to smell. Like think of the scenario of you actually achieving that goal and being on purpose. When you're making something easier and making a difference. What does that look like? What does it feel like? Like what, what is the emotion that you're going to go through? Maybe you're thinking about being in a certain place. Great. What, what's the furniture in that place? What are the smells in that place? If it's a restaurant, what's your favorite meal that you're going to eat when you're having this conversation and making things easier? And about 12 years ago, I was at a speaking event and it was about 150, 180 people. And near the end, they had asked me to explain visualization to these folks. It was all the same company. So they wanted a good unifying message. And I just asked, I said, who has a dream car you'd love to drive? And this little tiny hand goes up in the back of the room. And then this woman stands up and she says, well, I'm 62 years old and I'm going to retire next summer. And I've got a car that I want to drive to the beach in. I said, great. What kind of car? She goes, a 1970 Corvette, 74 Corvette. And everybody's looking at her. She was all of like five foot two. <laughs> she just this little tiny thing. 
And I said, oh, this is going to be good. What color? Having been in a Corvette, that's about the right size. <laughs> it is, I've heard. I'm a, I'm a giraffe sticking out of the roof of a Corvette. So I said, what color? She said, bright orange. I said, okay. Convertible or hard top? She goes, convertible. I'm going to the beach. I said, okay. Cloth or leather interior? And she goes, oh, honey, black leather. Everybody starts laughing. I go, great. What's going to be on the radio to listen to? She goes, Elvis Presley. I said, okay. When you get to the beach, what's your favorite place to eat? She goes, oh. Blinks fried dough, which is legendary here in New Hampshire, a place called Blinks. I said, okay. So we have got a bright orange 70 cor 74 Corvette convertible with black leather interior, Elvis on the radio, and you're going to get some mm, fried dough when you get there. She goes, yep. I said, that's visualization. How real is that? And everybody's nodding their heads going, that's how real you can make them. Tell the story and expose all your senses to it. By the way, the sense of smell is our strongest sense attached to either a memory or a potential outcome. Mm -hmm. That's why it's really important for houses to have some sort of nice scent in them when you, or offices to have a nice scent in them when you yeah. are trying to sell them or customers, like doctor's mm -hmm. offices, if they have a nice odor when you come in, it's not, yeah. it's a nice thing. Because yeah. it, you sense, the sense of smell is intangible, mm -hmm. but it's ethereal. I have that condition i don't know if it's a condition where i don't i can't you know I'll, when you visualize do you see like a movie in your head a lot of times it's still shots but sometimes it's a movie and it's a situation yeah so i i don't see images in my head mm -hmm. I, it's called anaphasia or something like that yep. and it's it's is that the right word do you know you know what i'm talking about though i believe it is and i've i've spoken with people who've got that uh condition in the past yes so my my i'm it's a family thing my cousins my aunt we i mean a lot of us have it but i can visualize yes. i can i can do exactly everything you do you just said and it comes down to scent feel salt water i mean i i don't see it but i can emotionally i guess be in tune with it right yeah. I mean, even if you think you can't visualize you can if you really put your mind to it yeah yeah. And if you're really struggling with it, I, what I've done is, is bounce it off the wall a slightly different way. I'll ask people, I said, what's your favorite memory of this? What's your favorite vehicle you've ever owned? What's your favorite vacation you ever went on? What's your favorite relationship you've ever been a part of? And they start to describe it. And then I said, okay, start to use, use those words. If you can't come up with the picture, use the words. My vision boards are a blend of both words, catchphrases, mantras, hashtags, along with the pictures. Mm -hmm. that I use. So they were kind of reliving the past, picking out the nuggets of gold and using those to set up the next level that they wanted to enjoy success for. And even if they couldn't see the picture, they could feel the emotions and then they could go looking online or people, I don't think they use magazines anymore. I just look online for things. I said, go online and do a search for something like that based on what you described and just see one that, you know, trips your imagination or, or makes you feel an emotion. And just start there. It's not saying that's going to be the end all be all, but it could get you from the ground level halfway up the first hill of that old wooden roller coaster. <laughs> At least mm -hmm. get you started to get closer to your goals. Mm -hmm. When I was 18, 18 years old, I bought a Volkswagen Rabbit convertible. It was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. I lived on the central coast of California, right on the coastline. And I was going to night school in college. And I would throw the top back on that car put on the radio. I would drive down the shore, you know, the shoreline, the, the, the breeze, the salt air from the, the, uh, the bay would just like overcome me. So I'd be, you know, the salt air, the smell, the, the feeling of the air whooshing around me and the music on the radio. Inevitably it's in your eyes by Peter Gabriel. When I hear that song, I am immediately transported to being 19 years old, driving that car down highway one in Monterey, California. That's the Immediately. best. And the thing about that though, is that I was 19 years old and the whole world was in front of me and there was nothing I couldn't accomplish. So it resets me back to, I can do anything I want. I can, yeah. I can accomplish anything. It's a great reset button. It is, it is. And, and music is so good for that. I've, I've been in, my mom said I could, I knew music before I knew anything else. And no wonder I became a DJ and, and you know, a, a hobby drummer. And I'm now <laughs> in my second recording studio because I was so in tune with the power of music. I mean, everything I do all day long, there's something playing in the background, whether it's 
my favorite classic rock or the calm app on my phone, which I think they should have just called the calm the heck down app. Mm. But that URL may not have been available. So. <laughs> but I, li I listen to music or, or sound uh, quite often because it puts me in a really good place. Yeah, the, my favorite thing is on Spotify, there is a um, lo-fi hip hop channel. Oh. And I just put it real low. Yeah. It's, it's lo-fi hip hop. So it's not hip hop. It's just the beats, right? Mm -hmm. Real, no lyrics, just really, and I put it, you know, put it down really low in the background. I get so much done nice. just having that beat, you know? And so I'll find myself like dancing and working and, and it, but there's no lyrics. So it doesn't get in your head. Right. Uh, it's just a nice kind of like house music. Again, I'm yeah. resetting back to basic. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Perfect. You know, I mean, what, it's the best. What happens when your computer isn't working? What do you do? You turn it off and turn it back on. Yeah. That's what my little in your eyes moment is. That's what the lo-fi music is. That's what your rock and roll in the background is. Yeah. We're just resetting back to basic. Yep. I love it. hundred percent. All right. Is there anything that you want to chat about that we haven't covered? Cause we covered a lot, but I don't think we've covered a lot about you. <laughs> What do you want to oh, share every, about Everything I share is about my journey because, you know, somebody asked me one time, once in a while you get these snotty people going, I've never heard of you. What qualifies you to teach this stuff? And, and I finally got sick of it because they'll ask, are you certified in NLP? No. Do you have a PhD? No. Are you a licensed therapist? No. Are you certified by the, the National or Worldwide Coaching Council? No. What qualifies you? So I finally got at a flea market for $15, this little old wooden framed blackboard. And I grabbed a piece of sidewalk chalk and I wrote, this guy lived it. I drew an arrow, put my face in front of the arrow and took a selfie. And now I send that to every snotty person who asks what qualifies me to do this. Everything I do is reflective of my own journey. If it works for you, great. If not, that's fine. Go find somebody whose message resonates for you. And the biggest shift for me that allowed me to feel that way and find strength in that and confidence in that was a big shift in my self-talk right around 2012. Because I was, after blowing up radio and first marriage and everything for another decade, I was brutal to myself. Even in the early days of my speaking, not my coaching so much, but my speaking, I could go on stage, get laughs being self-deprecating and talking about my biggest mistakes in life and acting like I was the clown prince of motivational speaking. It didn't do much for my credibility until a dear friend pulled me aside after a speaking event, after watching me melt down on stage, doing a 15 minute self-deprecating rant that was hysterically funny, but very damaging. He said, bro, you spoke for three days in a row on my stage. And I go, yeah. He goes, in 15 minutes, I just watched you undo all the goodwill you built up with our guests for three days. He goes, you just melted down and destroyed yourself. He goes, if I ever hear you talk about yourself like that again, we're no longer brothers and you're not welcome on any of my stage. And that was the moment that was June of 2012 that shifted it for me. And I said, you know, just because I get laughs doing it doesn't mean there's not a, a, a version of me inside that's taking all these hits as dimpled as a golf ball now from getting smacked around. And that's where the confidence started to grow. That's where my reputation started to grow. That's where my business got bigger. And that's how my influence started to go farther and farther. And I've been on over 300 shows around the world now as this version of my journey, because I lived it and I learned from it. That's the, the second part. Not only did I live it, I learned from it. And making that little shift in my self-talk made all the difference in the world. And even now I get up at 5.05 AM every Monday through Friday. And this is from Mel Robbins. First thing within five seconds, the five second rule. I turn off my alarm within five beeps. I go five, four, three, two, one, both feet on the floor, hit the bathroom mirror, turn all the lights on. First thing I do is a huge high five. That's her other one, the high five habit. And a big smile. And I point at myself and go, you, my friend, are going to rock this day. Let's go. Let's get started. And I go work out for 90 plus minutes. And that's where my days start, where I used to just get up and bash myself over and over and over. Playing the low light reels instead of the highlight reels. Thinking mm -hmm. of all the mistakes I'd made instead of the wins and the victories. Thinking about how I screwed up versus how I got to help people. It's a heavy weight to carry. It's like a backpack full of rocks that you put on every day. And you pick the hardest trail. Mm -hmm. So a big thing for me is just be mindful of your self-talk. It doesn't mean you have to go, hey, I'm awesome. It just means you recognize some goodness about yourself and the fact that you're a work in progress. And you cheer yourself on versus tear yourself down. 
It's a big, big. Well, you said something important. You have rocks in your backpack. You know, so many people just think they have to carry around that backpack with those rocks in it. They think they have to carry the rocks. It's so much easier to take the rocks out of the bag. No. And then there's room for then there's room for good stuff. When there's rocks in the bag, there's not enough room for your water and your food. Mm. You know, yeah. or your sleeping bag. You know, you need to eat, you need to drink, you need to sleep. Take the rocks out of your bag and make room for it. Yep. You know, wow, what a great what a great way to end. All right. <laughs> so how do people get a hold of you? I don't normally nice ask easy. I don't normally ask people that question because I put it in the show notes, but you yeah. get it on this, you get it today. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, my website is stevegamlin.com, G-A-M-L-I-N. And you can find me across social media under my name as well. Uh, mostly I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn, but I do some stuff on Instagram as well. So if anybody would like to find me there, if they have a question, fire away. I love connecting with people and just having conversations. I, I want to talk to you about that social media for a minute. Do you, why, why, did you, why do you have a preferred platform? What appeals to you? You said LinkedIn. Sorry, uh, I love a lot of my, a lot of the people that I regard very highly in my industry are on LinkedIn and I love to chip in my opinion or an answer or cheering them on. And I just find a lot more realness on LinkedIn versus a lot of the fake stuff on Facebook and Instagram of people just putting up that, that Kardashian lifestyle of theirs. It's a lot of fake stuff there, but for, I'm 56 years old, and a lot of the people I work with are between 35 and 60, and many of them are on Facebook. So it's it's still a pretty rich audience for me, but I go there and I just be as real as possible, and I get some pretty good engagement. I've noticed that Facebook is for friendships, LinkedIn is for colleagues. I recently reconnected with this. I'm really excited because he's going to be a guest in the future on the show. I reconnected with the CEO of the company I worked for. 30 something years ago. And I tell stories about him on this show a lot because I learned a lot from him. And I can't wait to be able to tell him the stories that I've been telling my audience about him. <laughs> and he probably won't even remember them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, if without LinkedIn, I wouldn't have been able to reconnect with him because he's, he's definitely not on Facebook. A few know. years ago, I reconnected with that teacher from fifth grade who had all that impact on me. And I happen to see her name as a friend of a friend. And I reached out and I said, is this the Mrs. Farron who taught at Highland Gosfall School in 1979? And within three minutes, she answered back, I always wondered what happened to you. Well, And I typed back in a good way, right? And she <laughs> says, yes, and a big laugh emoji. And I, I got to tell her how much she continues to mean to me all these years later. Isn't that rem remarkable? I, I had a similar situation where um, I am Facebook friends with several of my high school teachers, mm -hmm. um, but one of them I'm not Facebook friends with, but I saw that he was a friend of a friend. And this was the particular teacher that is the reason why I got A's in college. He taught me how to write an essay. When you know how to write an essay, it doesn't matter what else you do. And so I wanted to tell him. And I, and I, I didn't even send him a friend request. I just inboxed him and said, I just wanted to say, say thank you for teaching me how to write an essay because of you. I just, everything I just said. And uh, I think I made his day. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So if you ever see a teacher on Facebook or, in, or LinkedIn, tell them what the impact they had on you is, yeah. uh, was. Because, you know, teachers teach hundreds of students. And sometimes if I'm sure that they go home some days and they're like, why am I doing this? You know, and all these years later, I hope they realize what a big impact they made on me and you. I mean, they, I hope they do. They still do. The Just, ripples. Exactly. They never know where the ripples go. But boy, when you get to reach out to them and say, you know, I really appreciate that you were part of my life. And here's how you impacted me. Mm -hmm. and she said, she was, oh, my God. She was, it makes my day when I hear things like that, especially for me at that point, it was almost 40 years. Yeah. And she still remembered you. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Good stuff. And I want to be that person for others. That's, that's a big part of why I do this for my friend who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. That's my why for speaking. You made a difference and it was easy. Exactly. <laughs> I always call it. I said, look, effortless, just joy. Yeah. For me, it's, it's so hardwired that I just want to leave plus signs behind me all day, every day. And here's the best part. I own the factory. I'm never going to run out of positivity if I choose not to. Yeah. Some people think that, that you have to like pay for somebody else's meal or, but 
opening a door, smiling, yeah. letting somebody in in front of you. Yeah. You know, oh, there are so many ways that you can just do something kind. And it, it isn't going to take you any longer than it would have taken you to do the thing you were doing anyway. Yeah. And sometimes it might just, you know, hurt a little to make your smile go up instead of down. But, you know, yeah. use those smile muscles. Get yeah. it done. I play shopping cart rodeo whenever I go to the grocery store. My wife knows I'm not going to go right from the car to the store. I'm going to look out for a cart that was abandoned. And I'm not going to get torqued up that someone left it there and they were lazy. That doesn't even cross my mind. I just know somebody needed it to get that far. And I've, I've met people who were, you could just tell terminally ill mm -hmm. and they were using that just to be able to stay standing. Yep. And I will always ask from a safe distance, excuse me, would you like me to return that for you? It's never been refused. I've always gotten a smile and a thank you, which I don't need, but I'll just say, you know what? I hope you have a great day. By the way, take your purse out before I get there. Cause see all these cameras. I don't want it to capture you beating me up for trying to steal your purse. You're tiny and I'm big. And that would be embarrassing. <laughs> and they're laughing. And I walk away and I always look up and I go, yep, that, that, that little guardian angel, that person was the guardian angel because they made my day better. Do you have Aldi in, in New Hampshire? The we Aldi grocery stores? Aldi. That's okay. where we do our shopping for a nonprofit for local um, homeless shelters and food pantries because they have the most affordable prices. It just, it's so amazing. Like if I just wait a little bit for the person to finish unloading the car and I just hand them a quarter and take their cart. Yes. At Aldi, you pay a quarter for your cart. Yep. Right. And that way it incentivizes you to take your cart back instead of leaving it in the in the parking lot. Yeah. But just the look on their face that they don't have to walk, especially when it's snowing, that they don't have to walk back the cart back to get their quarterback. They just it's mm -hmm. just that little thing. And inevitably, every time it happens, the person just looks relieved. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't take it took me, you know, I waited 30 seconds for the cart. Yeah. You know, it doesn't take a lot of effort. Yeah. So we never anyway. know. Yeah. Ripples. Yep. Ripples. All right, Steve Gamlin, this is your moment of gratitude. For whom or what are you most grateful? I am most grateful today for my sister who knew that I had a, a hip injury. And a couple of months ago, she got me a gift certificate for a local place that does physical therapy and stretching. And I went there yesterday and it was phenomenal. So that was in this morning's gratitude journal. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the podcast for grateful micropreneurs building genuine, lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. To connect with Steve Gamlin, head over to the show notes at gratitudegeek.com. This is episode 238. I've been your host, Candice Rodardi. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends.